The opinions you are about to hear are contrary to the consensus of opinions by experts. Welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. My name is Michael Walker, and I'm here with my good friend, Mark. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, Walker. How are you? Always good. I'm broadcasting live from Revere, Massachusetts, from the Pocket Dimension. How does one get to the Pocket Dimension, you may ask? It's very, very simple. You go through the corner of Good Enough, through the kitchen that's not a kitchen, past the load-bearing air conditioner, up into the electronic saloon, and then you take the non-Euclidean staircase, and that is what gets you to the Pocket Dimension. I'm not actually making this up. The house I'm living in is wild. Nice. Secret chamber. I love it. It is actually kind of a secret chamber. It is on the main floor, but it is not accessible by the rest of the main floor. It is the only house I've ever stayed in where a legitimate answer could be, you can't get there from here. And one more thing before we get going. I just want to make it clear that I have no expertise in advent calendars, and nor do I wish to receive any more email about advent calendars. Thank you very much. So this is a board gaming podcast about board games. We're going to talk about our Aurus, the as yet unnamed retrospector of Indro segment. We're going to talk about the games we played last week, the news and why it doesn't matter. And then on to our topic of the week, which is trick-taking games. So Walker, what did we review last year? We reviewed a game called Clans of Caledonia, which is a worker placement. Is it though? A little bit. If I start engaging in terminological discussions now, it's never going to (laughs) stop. True. It's like it's a it's very much a tableau builder. You're removing stuff off your board. Oh, not that again! Oh, geez, you're just leaning into it, aren't you? (laughs) I know. I'm just building. I was like, how many avenues of game mechanics can I go? Can't we just say it's an awful lot like Terra Mystica? And whatever people think about Terra Mystica, they can think about Clans of Caledonia. It's so true. Much like Terra Mystica, where they they say there's a sort of like an opening move or ways to lock down the map. I really feel that is the same way with Clans of Caledonia as well. There is definitely an advantage to having played before to understand what it means to expand out on the map and the advantages to that and the disadvantage of of doing it incorrectly or not at all. So I, unlike other, you know, Euro games where you can pick up and sort of point salad your way along, this one you're definitely at a disadvantage right off the hop. I, all that is true. All that having been said, I do prefer Clans of Caledonia both to Terra Mystica and for what it's worth to Gaia Project. I think it has a touch more player interaction. I think it's a little more dynamic. I think the building requirements are a little more interesting. I like how the market works. I like how the, the contracts work. I played Clans uh, a couple of times since we reviewed it. It's available on Board Game Arena with a reasonably good implementation. There is rumors abound that Juma El Juju, the designer, has been hard at work on an expansion on and off. For several years, we don't know when it's going to come out because he's also a publisher. He's the one who runs Karma Games, and he says he's busy working on the publishing arm of it. So who knows when or if we will ever see the expansion. But I enjoy Clans of Caledonia. I think it's a solid Euro game. And that is the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. And now on to the games we played this week. Mark, I returned once again to Uprising, Curse of the Last Emperor. This is a cooperative troops on a map game. This is designed by Cornelius Kremen, Pavel Mirror, and Derek Sommer, put out by Nemesis Games. And so there's two big villains on the board. One is controlling the center and big baddies come out from there. And the other is chaos and it's coming out from the outside. And you are trying to... Uh, search hexes and expand your little havens and put out troops. So any of the listeners that remember Rune Wars, I think this is why I enjoy this game so much. It has all the feelings of Rune Wars. It has all the different levels of u- of units. It gives you this whole feeling of an entire world of many different races. It has your hero going off doing quests. But what it does do is streamlines it immensely. Even though the games have been taking super long, Rune Wars is an all-day event. So... This definitely streamlines that whole feeling that Rune Wars gave you of this huge epic sort of tons of different races clashing, but the players are doing it cooperatively against the game and it's being asked for by everyone who's played it. We'll be playing it a lot more 
Uprising Curse of the Last Emperor. It's also being asked for by the person who owns the game. I played Radlands. Radlands is designed by Daniel Pichnik and published by Roxley the last year after a successful Kickstarter. It's been getting a lot of plaudits, and I can kind of see why, but I can tell you that Radlands doesn't do a whole heck of a lot for me. I think it's fine, it's okay, but as far as two-player dueling card battlers goes, I'm actually very surprised, Walker, that you enjoy it as much as you do, because the overwhelming sense that I got from Radlands was that it's a game where you're trying to draw into an appropriate combo. In other words, Walker's patented critique of deck milling TMNC. And you either draw into your combo or you don't. And honestly, the card draw in Radlands is not very significant. You're not going to go through a lot of draws over the course of the game, and so there's a significant possibility of lucking into a particularly good combination. Even setting all that aside, that's not usually a critique that I have that features too prominently in a game of its length. But I feel that the length is also a little bit miscalibrated as well, because when I initially set up the game, I thought, oh, well, at least it won't have termination problems. Termination problems refers to a game where there might be a stalemate or there's some kind of a pseudo lock situation. And I was hoping that Radlands wouldn't be able to have a situation where there was lots of healing going on. But it can. There are lots of contexts in which there's lots of healing going on. So I exert a lot of energy to go and damage you and advance my victory conditions. You spend part of your turn just undoing the damage that I did to you. Oh, okay, well that happened. And yeah, with clever play, you're not going to see a whole heck of a lot of that, or at least it will minimize that effect. But when there are healing effects available, it makes sense to take advantage of them. I, I would think I would prefer Radlands considerably if that aspect were minimized or altogether eliminated. If there was no possibility to heal any of your bases, healing characters is fine. The goal of the game of Radlands is not to destroy characters, it's to destroy bases. And it's the healing of the bases that I actually found was a little bit obnoxious. Especially since, in Radlands, you can still use the special ability of bases when they're damaged. So, a way to ensure that the game will proceed to its conclusion would be to prevent that ability. Especially since, there are bases that allow you to heal bases, including themselves. I was not a fan of that aspect in particular. Now, maybe this was a bad draw. Maybe this was an unusual set of circumstances leading up to it. But I much prefer games like, for example, Rift Force or Blue Moon, where there's definitely going to be an endgame state. And you can plan for that endgame state. It adds a little bit degree of tempo considerations and an inexorable conclusion. I thought Redlands was, as I say, it was fine. But as far as quick, cheap, and cheerful card battling games, I'd still rather play Epic. I'd still rather play Rift Force. I'd still rather play Blue Moon. For something a little bit more complicated, I would happily go to things like Sakura Arms or other things of its ilk. I thought it was alright, but it's certainly not going to end enter my favorites of the genre. And so, again, I'm somewhat surprised you were so enthusiastic about it, Walker. Well, just to get back to the sort of deck milling part of it, I think there really is a decision space of when you should not wait, be waiting for this combo that you say you're you're hoping to get. You know, there's a there's opportunity to burn cards to put out punks or burn cards to draw more cards or burn cards to put out the, this interesting sort of event mechanic as it, you know, treads its way up to being resolved or pushing other events up or the, what is it called? The one that everyone gets the sort Raiders. of... Raiders. So the, yeah, the Raiders sort of mechanic where that you cannot defend against it. You know, you're just, you're damaging bases. I think there is a little bit there to counterdict the the deck milling part of it. Right, but there are no default attack actions. There's no sort of default way to aggress upon the enemy. And I think that really exacerbates the issue of trying to draw into a combo. You really need things to work together in order to make any serious progress. And if my opponent has a set of effects that work together synergistically, and I don't, telling me that I should just focus on my core competencies is not much of a comfort, given that there really aren't any core competencies in a game of Redlands. To a certain extent, that's its strength, right? You have different bases that have different effects, and your characters are defined almost exclusively by special abilities because they don't have core stats. Again, there's no notion of my 2-1 attacks your 3-2 creature or anything of that sort. And I, I applaud their attempt to go past that. But again, I think that that just leaves you more at the mercy of the card draw slash falling into certain combo effects. And that's just not what I appreciate in games of the silk. And that was my early experiences with Radlands. Perhaps Walker will change my mind. Who knows? Tabanusi is what I played. Tabanusi Builders of Ur. This is put out by Board and Dice, and it's in their T-series with Tolkien and Teotihuacan. 
The hook and or the interesting part of this is that there's five different spaces where you can do actions. And in each of those five spaces, there is a dice pool. And when you start the game, you put your two tokens in an area and then you choose one of the dice and whatever facing it is is the area you're going to you're on your next turn and not only that you take that die into your pool and now it is a resource and I thought that was just very interesting using the dice as resources and using it to go to the next area and they also tie into how the game scores because as soon as the dice pool is completed there's seven dice to start the game when it's gone that area scores and that will happen five times but all the other pools are not refreshed so in the game that we played we pretty well dispersed everywhere and we didn't you know burn down one particular spot so that as soon as that first one went the game almost ended immediately after that because you know that another one would go then another one would go and then before you knew it game was over so there's tons of other stuff going on but it, it it all it all you can see where it all came from. There's like the spot where you get technologies. You know you can see where he pulled stuff from his from the other games. But all in all, I am looking forward to playing it again because it does do it in a certain way that is very interesting. This you know go to an area, do two actions, and uh, you know there's all sorts of different ways they score. You're putting out real estate. You're creating these clusters, and you're trying to feed off of other people's actions. More to talk about later. Tabanusi Builders of Ur. Reading the description of Builders of Ur, I was struck by very much what you said. It seemed to have a clever core action selection mechanism slash approach to resources, but it seemed to be married to an overall architecture that we have seen 110,000 times before, including by the same publishers and the same designers. You get your texts, you get your orders in, you build some stuff, blah, 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 blah. So could be very much up my alley. Or then again, I might be bored to tears or somewhere in the middle. So I'm, I'm looking forward to giving it a shot, but who knows? I'm looking forward to hearing more of your observations, too. I played Shamans. Shamans is by Cédric Chabousset at Studio H. This is a trick-taking game with hidden identities. At the start of every hand, you might be a traitor or you might be one of the loyal shamans. And essentially, if you're the traitor, what you want to do is play off suit as much as possible. And... Every time you do, every time anyone plays off suit, you go down this track. If you get to the end of the track, then the bad guy or bad guys win, case depending, depending on how many traders there are. And whereas the goal of the loyal shamans is to play out the entirety of the hand without that track being exhausted, i.e. to play on suit as much as possible. And uh, that central conceit was really interesting. And it has a, some of the other trappings of the hidden trader genre. Namely, there is a way to eliminate somebody from the round. So if somebody is playing offsuit too brazenly, you know, someone leads a yellow and they follow with a red, but then someone leads a red and they follow with a yellow. Eh, clearly, they're up to something. And there is a way to eliminate them, but it's it's a little tricky, and you have to get your ducks in a row, and that part was calibrated really, really well. And, of course, talking with the other friends and groaning about what card play someone's doing, and the person shrugging and saying, I, I, I couldn't help it, I had to, and trying to figure out if they're lying and trying to remember what they played elsewhere. All of that was very much inherited from the social deduction genre, and I think it was pretty successful. Where it was a little bit less successful was, I think, uh, with three, it's not at its best. We played it with three. And the calibration there doesn't seem to be quite ideal by virtue of just how the track shakes out and the communication goes. The other thing is that we were playing the game incorrectly because we were playing the game as per the published rules. Because this is something that we, we all puzzled over. It says in the published rules, and I quote, You may speak freely about your cards as long as you do not mention their colors or numeric values. End quote. Well, what's left? That they are cards? They're very rectangly, precisely and thin. And so we made a number of those exact jokes while playing the game. Turns out that what the designer actually meant to communicate was that you are allowed to talk about what you have in your hand, so long as you do not mention the precise value and color combination of what the cards are in your hand. In other words, you can say, everyone, I'm void in yellow. Just so you know, I don't have any yellow to play. Or you can say, I've got very high yellow cards, but you cannot say, I have the yellow five. 
That is effectively what they were trying to communicate, but they failed in the, the rules writing. I'm mentioning this in case anyone plays shamans, you are allowed to say the very crucial, don't lead gray, I don't have any gray. Because that, that seems like pretty core communication rules as far as a game of this ilk goes. I enjoyed shamans. I think it was clever. It was an interesting twist on trick-taking. And with the proper rules, I think it would be yet more engaging. I would want to play it again with four or five. I don't think I would play it again with three. I don't think that was showing it to its best self. But I did specifically like how it dealt with the elimination element for a given hand. And another great thing about it as far as social deduction games go, if you're not a huge fan of the aspect of being iced out because you've been found out to be the traitor or you figure it's obvious who's loyal, it only lasts for the rest of a hand. A hand is only a small number of cards. Next deal goes. You might be loyal. You might be a traitor. You don't know. It's it's a it's a good way to shuffle it through. So I applaud it for its inventiveness. And under the right circumstances, I would happily give it a try again. That is Shamans by Cédric Chaboussi. Yeah, that sounds sounds super fun. Speaking of fun, <laughs> I wasn't speaking about fun. We don't no fun talk here. We streamed our number one game of 2021 this past Saturday. Ankh, Gods of Egypt. We stream every Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, and it goes on Twitch and YouTube at the same time, and YouTube after the fact. So if you go to our YouTube channel under the live tab, all the games we play will be there. And what this game taught me, Mark, is how much I love how people play games differently hmm. and different reasons why people play games. And some people play games because they really want to win. And some <laughs> people like me want to play games because they're really fun. And part of the fun is the flow of the game and sort of just watching the game evolve. And then at the end, hit a brick wall as people <laughs> add up every single points of every single action other people could take. But it was still super fun because there's a couple people that are were brand new to Ankh, so it was fun to show them the, the merging mechanism. And it was interesting because I purposely manipulated the score so no one was way behind because I wasn't sure where I was going to end up. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I had a chance in the merge turn to jump very far ahead. So I took that, and it, I think that what is what lost me the game. I think if I had just stayed back that turn and waited till the next turn as part of the merging army to take that big jump, but I couldn't risk being the one that was slightly less and losing everything and then not being anyway, long story short, Gonk's gods of Egypt by Eric Lang published by Simon still a fantastic game. And I can't wait to play it more in person. A surprise for me this week was scout. Scout is a game that's going to be published by Oink Games uh, very imminently. It was originally published prior to that, but Oink, the Japanese publisher of tiny, colorful, and cute little boxes, is going to be picking it up, and it was designed by Kei Kajino. Scout is a climbing game, and whether or not we're going to be spending more time talking about climbing games later on is something I will probably discover just after the topic is introduced, and I ask Walker what he thinks about climbing games and their relationship to trick-taking games. Scout is a very, very simple game where the conceit is that every card has two possible values, and you are not allowed to rearrange your hand after the initial draw. Anyone who's played Bonanza is familiar with this conceit, where normally, especially in, in climbing games or trick-taking games, the first thing you do is you rearrange your hand so you can track things. In Scout, you are not allowed to do that. In point of fact, the only decision you make at the initial deal of a hand is you either keep your hand as it is, or you can just rotate every card 180 degrees in your hand, because as I said... Every card has two values, so a card might be a 1, but you could rotate it to be a 6, or it might be a 5, and you could rotate it to be a 9, or what have you. And every card is, is thereby unique. And basically what you're doing is you're playing a climbing game where you're playing the standard thing about sets and runs and so forth, but if you are not inclined to beat the current set that is currently face up on the table, you can scout it, i.e. take the card from either end and add it to your hand wherever you want. That is the only way you get to rearrange your hand is when you scout it. The key to this, and why I mention this, is because this allows you to build combos. This allows you to build better sets. One of the key problems I often have with certain climbing games, certainly the traditional ones, like, uh, depends on what you want to call it, millionaire or a-hole or president or what have you, it goes under a million different names, is frequently the tempo ends up being largely the same. You play the sets of the same value roughly the same time. With Scout, by virtue of the scouting element, you could look at your hand and notice that in the mid middle of your hand you have a 4, 5, 6, 
eight, and you desperately need the seven. Well, if somebody plays a seven on one end of a set, you can just scout it, slot it right in the middle there, and now you have your run. Because, again, you're not allowed to rearrange your hand, and you can only play adjacent cards. That part was great. Simple rule set, really, really quick and engaging, lots of moans of despair and frustration over the course of the game because you're trying to play sets that people cannot beat, but in the process of scouting from the set, the set gets weaker as the time goes on. Anyway, lovely little bits of ebbs and flows from an incredibly simple and straightforward card game. Very quick, but at the same time, you don't feel like you're hampered by the luck of the draw in the way you are in a lot of these other games by virtue of, again, the fact that you care about the strength of a set rather than necessarily the values of the cards, and you can build better sets as the hand goes on. So in a three-player game, we only played three hands, which is marvelously quick, but I didn't feel like the deck really hurt or helped anyone considerably, and that's, that's, that's really high praise. So Scout is very novel. I highly recommend it. I'm looking forward to playing more Scout. It was a great surprise to me, and I think everyone should give it a shot, even if you don't like climbing games. I'm not a huge fan of climbing games as a general rule, but Scout was definitely an exception. Lastly, for me, it was a week of letting people play what they wanted. And like I said, they went to Uprising, and they also went back to Steam Watchers, another Troops on a Map game. This is designed by Mark Lagroy and put out by Mythic Games. And the hook in this is you start the game pretty well as strong as you're going to be. And you're holding these steam plumes and they're going to downgrade right in the first turn. And the replayability is there's all these different missions that you get to play. It'll mess with the turn order. It'll mess with the victory conditions. It'll uh, mess up where you're going to start. There are seven different factions that you can choose from, all with different special abilities. Can't say enough just because it is my cup of tea. You're you're deciding when to hold the territories. You don't want to hold them too early because it's creating this toxin that are killing your troops. You don't want to build too fast because the bigger you build, the more of your figures you're going to lose. And therefore, you can't put them on the board anymore because they're out of the game. Loving Steam Watchers. Check it out. Week of classics for me, or at least recent classics. Played a few games of Regicide, played a few games of Micro Macro or Crime City Full House. There were some really intricate cases in my playings of Full House. Usually there is a correspondence between degree of difficulty and intricacy of case, but I played a couple of two and three star difficulty cases that were very complicated, actually, in terms of who was doing what to whom, and you have to follow different people and chase different threads. It was really cool. But in terms of classics, one cannot speak of classics without mentioning El Grande. And I would compare El Grande to a nice plate of brownies in two salient ways. One of them is that it is warm, sumptuous, delicious, and comforting, and everyone loves them. And number two, it is aggressively brown. Brown, brown, brown all the way down. So El Grande is now available in beta on Board Game Arena, and that is the venue in which we tried it. I rounded up a bunch of patrons from our Patreon-only Discord, and we gave it a try. The implementation, I would say, is okay. There's no undo. The way you activate some of the action cards was not particularly transparent, and so there were a couple of misplays as a consequence of that, which, again, we could not undo. So be careful about where you click and when, which I suppose is good advice for all transactions on the internet, but especially so in the case of El Grande. El Grande is the absolute progenitor of most area majority games, and I think is still better than all of them. It is my preferred area majority game, even after all these years. And I really think that when people make sweeping declarations about what Euro games are, again, I'm not particularly fussed about categorization or taxonomies, but I hear people issue these very strong statements. Well, it can't be a Euro game. This isn't a Euro game. It has too much player interactions. Like, well, okay, sure. Recent definitions, I guess. But then I guess Hansa Teutonica and El Grande aren't Euro games. And if they aren't Euro games, then what is? And then I guess Settlers of Catan isn't a Euro game either. Anyway, not that they're all equally good. We're not huge fans of of Settlers, but El Grande absolutely is one of the best games of the 90s. And if you haven't given it a shot, well, now you have your opportunity. I think it's between printings yet again. 
And El Grande is something that everyone, I think, should give a, uh, give a try because it is simultaneously accessible and yet endlessly rewarding. I'm still learning new things about different combinations and different timing elements and different gambits about how to, how to best exert force and when to retreat in El Grande. The great thing about El Grande is you're never really married to a given position. You always have the option, if you want to, of completely pulling up stakes and showing up somewhere else. It's a lot like life in that regard. No, it's not. I'm not going to bother trying to tie this into some sort of great life lesson. Because travel is a curse visited on a sinful humanity for its crimes and foibles. But anyway, El Grande is not a curse visited on humanity. It is an unrelenting delight. So as I say, it's in beta now on Board Game Geek. It is absolutely worth playing with four or five players. The box claims two to five. This is a lie. Some people refuse to play with less than five. I think you're missing out with four. El Grande is still some very solid El Grande. And that is El Grande by Wolfgang Kramer and Richard Ulrich, originally published by Hans M. Gluck in 1995. And finally for me, I played The Field of the Cloth of Gold by Amabel Holland at Hollenspiel. This is a very simple two-player game that she apparently designed and published in the space of a couple of months. It is about a famous meeting between the King of England and the King of France in the early 16th century, where they basically, in uh, the designer Amabel Holland's word, words, peacocked at each other for a great deal of time, and nothing of consequence happened, except in the process, England consumed, by many modern estimates, a third of its total economy by showing off. And in the Field of Cloth of Gold, what you do is you are constantly giving your opponents gifts. And this allows, by the way, for some of my favorite elements of light roleplay in board games. I'm a big fan of a lot of elements of gift culture. And so you might go to a space and give a blue tile to your opponent. And a lesser person or a person who approaches board games in a radically different way, I suppose I don't want to judge them as being a lesser person, might just hand them the blue token. But in the case of the Field of Cloth of Gold, you might say... Henry, my dear friend, my brother, here, take this dolphin. I hear his name is Hector and that he is especially succulent. Enjoy this dolphin. Because apparently they ate dolphin at this thing. <laughs> and baboons and a whole bunch of... It. Anyway, the theme is very much pasted on. This could be a game about any sort of transactional tile exchange, but the historical trappings absolutely make it utterly hilarious. And it's a very, very simple game. Literally, all you're doing is just visiting a space, which might allow you to cash in tiles for points, and giving your opponent a tile. This keys into Amabel Holland's threads of design philosophy. She loves designing games where everything you do advances your opponent's position as well. And so frequently, you're left in a position of having to do what is least bad for you, or at least least good for your opponent, as opposed to advancing your own victory conditions. At its worst, I find that sometimes these can lead to stalemates. At its best, I think what you get are games like Northern Pacific or The Field of the Cloth of Gold, where, yes, you're in a difficult position and nearly everything you do will, will benefit your opponent, but you can at least find a way to shave the margins and progress the game state. Uh, because some of the games that Amabel Holm has designed, like, for example, This Guilty Land, are premised very much on Zugzwang and Stalemate. Those are not design elements that I appreciate. Fine, put me in a difficult position, put me in a position where many of my moves will benefit my opponent, but at least progress the game state so that something happens, and there's interesting development, as opposed to at the end of a couple of turns of action, nothing has happened, and no one has advanced anywhere. So, The Field of the Cloth of Gold is a very quick, very simple, very approachable design, with a little bit of absurdist historical trappings, and quite frankly, that is absolutely the kind of thing that I'm in the mood for, if I'm going to be playing with two players and playing a lot of lighter games over the course of an afternoon. And so I found it very delightful. I don't know if it's worthy of a full big box design. This might be the kind of thing where you might want to go to Hollenspiel and take advantage of the print and play options because it's very much just a sheet, a small number of tokens, and then some tiles. So if you're able to proxy the tiles especially, then it'll make things very easy. But it is a fascinating little design and a very strange element of history to shine light on. The Field of the Cloth of Gold by Hollenspiel. And those are the games we played this week. Now, on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Well, I purchased Bonfire about a year ago, Mark, and played it all of once. But now, <laughs> it is on Yukata, and it is a great little implementation. We're halfway through a game now. It made me realize why I 
picked it up in the first place. Lots to do. Very interesting mechanisms. Expansion coming out for it soon. Check out Bonfire on Yakata. When I come to visit you in Kingston, Walker, put Bonfire on the list. Write it down. Inscribe it onto the list of games we shall play. It is therefore chiseled in the tablet of play. Let it be so. Mark, there's a game called Yak coming out by a company that we enjoy, Pretzel Games and Plan B Games. You are driving this very adorable yak in around this circle. There's four yaks drawing carts. I'm and you're there. Picking up these giant, you, I know, you're picking up these giant slabs of stone and milk and bread, and you're trying to build these fancy walls. And depending on how you build them, you're going to be scoring points. So you're sort of planning ahead. You're seeing this yak. Oh, he has two red and a yellow. I need those. But then as you're watching the yak come closer to your village, this fog rolls in. And suddenly all the yaks are going in the opposite direction. And and so now the yak that was supposed to come to your village is not. And the yak that left your village is coming back again. It's just chaos, Mark. <laughs> what are you going to do? It's a yak rodeo it's, is what it is. It's Yeah, it's, it's just what yaks are all about. So looking forward to giving <laughs> that a try. Yak by Pretzel Games. The next game of the Valiant Defense series is up on Kickstarter now. David Thompson is one of my favorite designers. And the Valiant Defense series is one that Walker and I are both very fond of, starting with Pavlov's House and Castle Itter, and the one of the top games of last year in both of our estimations, namely Soldiers and Postman's Uniforms. The next game is called Lanzarath Ridge. It is unfortunately about the Battle of the Bulge. I say unfortunately because all the previous games had, to my mind, a little bit more of a personal touch in terms of a slightly more obscure engagement, with the minor exception of Pavlov's House. And quite frankly, I am sick to death of hearing about the Battle of the Bulge from American War Game Designers. But it's a popular conflict, and I have confidence that David Thompson will find a way to make it engaging. And I am confident also that it is not as generic as I'm making it out to be. I'm all in on the pledge because David Thompson's work is amazing, and the Valiant Defense series games have so far all been excellent. That is Lanzarath Ridge up on Kickstarter right now. Well, if you like multi-use cards, Lagrange has multi-use cards in spades. And Board and Dice are bringing Lagrange back through a Kickstarter. No spades, though. Multi-use cards, but none of them are spades. It's true. So it's up on Kickstarter. It's a game that is kind of hard to get right now. It is on BGA, so if it's something that you're interested in, you can always check it out there. You can, you know, place your cards for livestock, for planting troops, for special abilities, for employees, and the way that they're making, I think it's, you know, because double-layered boards are just not enough anymore, Mark. These are triple, quadruple-layered boards, (laughs) so you can slide your cards in and they won't be disrupted but it was a very interesting game i enjoy playing on board game arena so if it is your thing check it out i took a look 90 dollars for the base pledge oh but you can get the the granja granja the super deluxe version for a cabillion dollars yeah and in all of (laughs) so on the topic of vastly too much money I joked that when Blood Rage was up on Kickstarter, or indeed when some of the pseudo-expansions were up on Kickstarter to Blood Rage, if Simon wanted to make a version where there was some sort of plinth that was nominally Yggdrasil and they would charge $5 million for it, I would be very, very tempted to give them all of my money. Sure enough, an independent group of Dutch 3D modelers has decided to put up on Kickstarter 3D printable files for Blood Rage board elements, specifically plastic province tiles that can be removed and to show the level of damage after they've been Ragnaroked, and of course, a plastic Yggdrasil world tree for the middle of the board. Now, I don't have any 3D printer myself, and I certainly don't have any uh, painting ability to make it look nearly as nice as they do, but it's a pay-what-you-want system, and I am more than happy to support this kind of creativity and add-ons for a game that I love. So, check it out on Kickstarter. These are 3D printable, pay-what-you-want files for Blood Rage. Maybe someday I will cajole someone into making them for me. Lastly... So Portal Games did a ultimate edition of Neoshima Hex. Apparently that must have did very well because now they're doing the 51st State Ultimate Edition campaign, which will launch February 22nd. So now you can get a giant big box for all of your 51st State 
stuff, whether or not they're going to allow us to uh, just buy the box so you can store everything with just the new extra stuff, or you're going to be forced to buy the entire thing. Time will tell. There's not very much information on it at the moment, but let's hope they do a nice job. Walker, the expansions to 51st State Master Set have all just been decks of cards. Yes, and they've all fit in the normal box so far. Very easily. I'm a bit dubious. Even if you, shudder the thought, sleeved them, (laughs) they would still fit very, very easily. Yes. So I'm not sure what they're going for here. But like I said at the beginning, since the Nirishima Hex one went so well, maybe... This is why they think that this people want this one next, maybe. Sure. Well, we'll we'll see what it is. They're introducing a bunch more, a few different new factions and upgraded uh, resources. But the resources are great. They're all wooden pieces, so I don't know. The resources are already great, and new factions in Fifty First State Master Set are just a small piece of cardboard. Oh well. <laughs> like I said, time will tell, and we'll see if it's worth it. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. On to our topic of the week, which is trick-taking games. Walker, first of all, why did you, not that I'm dubious, why did you want to talk about trick-taking games? Well, I'm very taken with the new crew and the little mechanism they had. And it just made me think of, you know, why trick-taking games are so fun for me or why they do so well or why they're just so versatile. That is an excellent observation. That's a good name. Versatile. <laughs> name for what or whom? So I'm going to start off, oh, yeah, because you, you you seem to think that you're going to try to push climbing games no, into this category. No, 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 no. I was going to ask because some people either don't differentiate between them or argue that the difference is merely a distinction without a substantive difference. I can tell from your skepticism and overall haughty, dismissive demeanor that you are not among these people or not um, not sympathetic to this point of view. Exactly. Trick-taking, there must be a leader. They must play (laughs) a color or suit, and everyone must follow that color or suit. Oh, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. Let's not get into essentialism here. There are lots of trick-taking games where following is optional. Nope. No, no. Oh, wow. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> Why do you keep wanting to be... So, okay. So, Shamans is not a trick-taking game. Are you not... Do you not... Are you not forced to play? How are you supposed to know what people have in their hands if they're not forced to follow suit? Well, because... <laughs> because what they play will issue very various communication about what loyalty they have. I suppose so. I just... Look. No, no. I'm only, I'm only being silly. I'm okay, only being silly. Okay, I'm just saying enough. that the essence, of, the essence of a trick-taking game is, you know, a leader playing a suit and everyone following it. I'm sure, of course, there can be variations of that. But Thank you for your essence, broad that is, In essence, that is what a trick-taking game is. Yeah, to me, the big difference between a trick-taking game and a climbing game, and again, this is not a hard and fast distinction, and I'm not going to argue that there are no exceptions to this distinction, but the big distinction is, in a trick-taking game, you're only going to play once per go-round. You know, the trick is going to happen. It is a trick, and it's going to end. And in a climbing game, you might be expected to play several times before the cards are wiped away and a new leader plays. But again, as I say, I do see some similarities, but let us therefore, with that, banish any further discussion of climbing games. All right, so I'm going to start off with, I feel that trick-taking games work better when everyone is on the same level. If you have very seasoned players that have played trick-taking games a lot, and you try to bring people who have not played them at all, there is definitely a dysfunction there there's definitely like the innis problem where one link weak link is going to ruin the whole sort of way the game is supposed to flow absolutely now there are some there are some trick-taking games that are a little bit more robust than that but many trick-taking games there's a phase at the end of the game or the end of the round that is often not mentioned in the rule book and that is the recrimination phase or the airing of grievances phase where the people who either know more or have more experience or think they do turn to other people and say, why did you lead the four then if you had this other card in your hand? Why were you screaming lies to the rest of the table? And then this poor other player, let us call this other player Mark. No, no, sorry. Let me think of a pseudonym. Uh, let us call this other player so very well about games host B. Then shrugs and says, I don't know. Should I not have led the four? 
Well, that's 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 the sort of the the play, but there's even the outside skirts of trick taking, like just the bidding at the beginning of some of these. Games. Oh, yeah. A lot of these trick taking games, you need to guess how many tricks you're going to take, or or things like that. And without have knowing, you know, look, you look at your hand. You've never played a trick taking game. You have no idea. You're just guessing. <laughs> or some of the trick taking games allow you to pass cards. How do you have any clue what to pass if you? If you've never played a trick-taking game before or playing a trick-taking game with a partner, there's a whole different mindset that you need when you're playing that type of game. And if you're brand new to that mechanism, I think you're, you're in a lot of trouble. Absolutely. It's very much like auction games in that sense. And indeed, many people would argue that trick-taking games are just a kind of auction game. I, if I were in, in, inclined to suppress the point, I might indeed advocate that position. But yeah, the bid is very much like an auction game. You look at your assets and you figure, I don't know what to bid with this stuff. Sure, there are certain heuristics you can import. If you've played spades before or any bidding trick-taking game, you might have some notion. But I remember once when I tried to... I, I, well, tried to is, is an exaggeration. Thought I might be curious about learning how to play bridge. And I realized that learning how to play bridge is very much like learning how to play Go. You don't learn by playing. You learn by going through a series of exercises that demonstrate how stupid you are and that you don't know what you're doing. Because the the, the, the quote-unquote education I got about bridge from both a tutorial program and from a couple of people who knew how to play bridge was just, oh, no, 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 we're not going to play. You're not ready to touch the cards yet. I'm going to show you a hand and you tell me what you bid. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll bid three clubs and then they would laugh and and smack me upside the head so yeah like i said i don't want to even say anything because i've never played bridge but my mother plays bridge and i get to hear about bridge and i don't think you actually play it <laughs> as, as and like the card the playing of the cards part is not the game in that particular yeah. trick taking sense it's 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 is all about the communication and the bidding part, and it seems almost like the, the, the playing of the cards is just to show how wrong you were. Have you read about cheating in at high level international bridge play? Yes. It's so fascinating. I've heard stories, yes. I, yeah, it's I, so I, there, weird. There are these investigations and people cracking codes and various shenanigans. I, it is endlessly fascinating. And I think this actually dovetails to one of the things that I, I like the most and the least about trick-taking games. And that is that trick-taking games especially, like, we're involved, Walker, you and I, in a very strange subculture, right? Like, we play these weird games that nobody outside our hobby has ever heard of, and we talk about these genres and care very much, or some of us do, about the difference between area majority and area control and all this other kind of nonsense, right? But trick-taking games is an entire universe unto itself, that is based on regionalisms, you know, some trick taking games that are dominant in some like cities, not even areas of the country, but certain cities with strange occult minutiae and bizarre. Like you tried to communicate to me a suggested title for today's episode. I thought you were speaking a different language. I don't know these words. There are these bizarre words. I thought cribbage was bad, but trick taking games are just as bad. It's this odd cant. <laughs> it's so true. But the cool part about that. And it sort of dovetails in is that you get to play with a standard deck of cards. And there's so many different games you can play with this standard deck of cards. When it comes to trick-taking, of course, there's a ton of games you can play with a standard deck of cards. But when it comes to trick-taking games, they're almost always done with a standard deck of cards. There might be different pictures on them, different colors. But in the end, it's fairly standard cards. And I, this actually leads directly to my next question. You're a Euchre guy, right? You grew up with Euchre, correct? I did. Which apparently, I, I did did a tiniest, a soupçon of research on this. Apparently, it used to be much more popular in the United States than it is now. But its popularity has remained constant in Canada. And so it is arguably sort of a Canadian game. There are parts of the prairies where they don't play it. But it is popular on both the East and West Coast, and very, very much so in Ontario. I think I played Euchre once. And uh, it's weird. It's, it's, it's a strange game. You say you play with a standard deck of cards, and that's true, but it, you only play with basically half the deck. Correct. You take out all the low cards. Yeah, the low cards are boring. Nobody wants to play a seven. Playing a seven is exactly. not fun. Get rid of the seven. <laughs> yeah, who, who wants it? Okay, so actually, and a feature of Euchre I find very striking, because this is where, for some reason, it just breaks my brain. And this is one of the reasons why I find a number of trick-taking games, both the, the conventional ones and a lot of the hobbyist ones, 
much more impenetrable than they should be. Because trick-taking at its core is remarkably simple. Like, if you look at the rules for Whist, Whist being the sort of characteristic trick-taking game that predates Bridge and is the game they play in all the uh, Jane Austen novels, if you're into that kind of thing, Whist is bone simple. It's just a, there's, there's a trump suit. You gotta follow if you can. You want to win as many tricks as you possibly can. That's it. That's Whist, more or less. But... Euchre has one of the details that really serves to confuse me. And that is, and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, there's going to be a trump suit in Euchre for every for every hand, and the jack of the suit of the same color as the trump suit is considered to be part of the trump suit and indeed higher than the ace, king, and queen of the trump suit. So, if trump is spades, the jack of clubs isn't a club anymore. No, no, no. It's a spade. It may say club on the card, but it's a spade now, and you have to remember that. You have to follow, and pr- like someone leads it, you have to remember, blah, blah, blah. And Excuse it- me. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes? They're called bowers, Mark. Oh, jeez. You, That's what that you, word means? Can you... Yes. Bo- both jacks or just the other jack? No, both of them. Okay, thank you. And this is one of those things where it just, it seems so simple. This one card... It, you just pretend it's a different suit. The moment any trick-taking game, and a lot of trick-taking games do this, I'm going to talk about some of them later, the moment you say that a card isn't what it is printed on it, it's something else, I immediately get confused, and chances are excellent that I will forget at least half a dozen times over the course of the game. Well, remember, like, President and A-Hole do the same thing, where the twos are, you know, suddenly more powerful than, you know, the face cards, right? Only, so the same. only sometimes. And that's even less bad because there you just have to remember a different ranking. True. For example, in many card games, aces are low. That's just a thing you have to remember. But it's still printed on the card. You don't pretend that the ace of spades is the seven of clubs or something random like that. <laughs> it's it's true. <laughs> and I, I say this despite the fact that one of my favorite trick-taking games, which is Vashtikt, by Karl Heinz Schmiel, actually does this nonsense. In Vashtik, they do one of the things that a lot of hobbyist trick taking games do. There is a Trump suit and a Trump number. So, you know, Trump could be yellow and sevens. And then you have to worry about rankings. Like, is are sevens better than yellows or are yellows better than sevens? And you have to remember that the yellow seven is super Trump. And nonsense like that. Again, I'm willing to tolerate it. Vashtik, I think, is a great game. But it's always the kind of thing where it's it's so simple. I can, like, I, you can put a Vlada Kvadl game that I last played three years ago in front of my face. And I will have a much easier time picking up that up than I do trying to remember the interface between color and number that some of these trick-taking games go. Anyway, it's a bizarre personal failing. So the next few things I have are other reasons why trick-taking games are are interesting to me and sort of like we've talked about in like Tigers and Euphrates or chess or barony where you're forcing the play, right? You're controlling the table. You're sort of forcing what other players can do. And in the case of your partner, you're sort of guiding them on what you want them to play. You're sort of, you know, nuancing, you know, your play and trying to control what, or sorry, uh, guide them into what you want them to play on your hand. Yeah. This is the cheating part, right? Exactly. <laughs> and then there's a bunch of other things that make trick-taking games great. Easy to teach, easy to train. It's some, sorry, some of them are. Some of them because are, yeah. If you, have the, if you have the basics of trick-taking, then sometimes it's easy just to say, okay, well, this one, it's hook, or the thing it does differently is X. And so you're right on board and you're right, you know, playing into the next one. So easy to transport. It's usually just a small deck of cards and it's easy to store on your shelves. You have this giant bin Oh, trick-taking games. <laughs> you, you've been saying for years how trick-taking games are so easy to teach, especially since once you know one, you know you know hundreds of different games. I think it's actual- true, I've, but I've, I've changed it though. I, okay, I, I've changed it too. It's it's just easier to t- to teach. It's easier it's, to learn other trick-taking games once you know the premise of trick-taking. I think that's a bit of a double-edged sword. I agree with you, but at the same time, I don't. Because precisely like those weird, subtle differences, like not having to follow suit, right? Or 
a game where suddenly aces are low when you, the game that you're familiar with aces are high. Or a game where you're reliably trying to win as few tricks as possible instead of the games where you're reliably trying to win as many tricks as possible. Or games where going over your bid are not penalized very harshly. Or games where going over your bid are super heavily penalized. Minor differences like that when you're when you're really in the weeds of a given trick-taking game can be very, very hard habits to break. Next, I've... Next up, I have, speaking of things that they do differently are when there are secondary powers on the cards. So now you have a huge decision to make. Do I want to keep this card for its power or do I want to play it and take this trick or do I even want to throw it away? Or I just love that sort of balance or that sort of, you know, that weighing the choices over top of what you usually have to do in a trick taking game. Games like the Fox in the Forest, right? Yeah, or Brian Boro, right? Yeah. You're, you can you look down at the hand. It's like I really want to do the primary power here, or I really want to do the secondary power. But if I play this, I'm going to win this trick. And you know, it's very, you know, great gameplay. Those trade offs that are, I think, some of the best additions that the sort of hobby game market have done to the traditional trick taking formula. Because for a long time, I felt that a lot of the hobby variations of trick taking games were really making them worse. I'm thinking particularly of, you know, roughly the, the last half of the 20th century. A number of, of hobby trick-taking games that I thought were way too obtuse for their own good. I'm thinking specifically of Cosmic Idex to a lesser extent, and mostly Mu. Mu, it was just, ugh, there were a couple times where people tried to teach me that game. It's a nightmare of, okay, well, you bid this, so what happens is you're the under thing, and the under thing gets to t- declare the under trump, which could be color or could be number, but if you declare number, then the other side can only do color, and then there's, uh, it was so, look, I played that game half a dozen times, and I never understood what was going on, and that, I think, is a pretty ringing condemnation of my ability to play it. Not necessarily of the game. I'm willing to put it on my shoulders. Because as I said, I have mental blocks when it comes to understanding certain trick-taking games. But there were a bunch of ostensibly simple trick-taking games published around that period. I just could not wrap my head around. Just on the story of Mew, Mew and, and More, which is what you pick up now, is just sort of feeds back into where I said, you know, transport and all in one. It's like, you know, seven games all in one standard deck. So I thought that was very interesting as well. It's important to stress there are two different versions. There is Moon and More, and then there's Moon and Lots More. Moon and Lots More is the version that's that's been in print more recently, and it's the one that comes with Vashtikt, but does not come with Black Panther, which is one of uh, my group's favorite anti-trick-taking games. You know, there's some trick-taking games like Hearts, where you just don't want to win any tricks, except for certain exceptions like Shooting the Moon. And so there, there, there's weird overlaps and uh, lacunae between the two versions. I would recommend Mu and lots more because, as I say, it has Vashtik in it. Anyway, minor publication note. So another reason why trick-taking games might be interesting to some people is, I don't know, I guess I can say it's like Solitaire in a way. Not, sorry, not, not the actual gameplay itself or not that it's like a solitary experience other than the fact that the cards are all out on the table and there is a puzzle to figure out. So once everyone has their five cards, there is definitely a best play scenario. So it's like a whole puzzle, sort of like you, if you figure out exactly what the best play is, there is you know, no, no denying that best play move. Which is one of the many reasons why I prefer playing trick-taking games with fellow incompetence. Like I say, if you try to learn Go from somebody who knows how to play Go, if you try to learn Bridge from somebody who knows how to play Bridge, they're basically like, look, this is a solvable puzzle. I solved it within five seconds of looking at the thing, and you're just wasting my time by playing like a completely incompetent monkey. And it's like, but maybe I could get some other monkeys together and we could all have a fun time flinging poo at each other? That's the level at which I enjoy trick-taking games. All right, I just have a couple things, and then a sim- okay. So losing on purpose a lot, a lot. That's what I sort of like. Uh, mm, yes. in some of these newer trick taking games is that usually you always want to win. You want uh, you know as many tricks as you want, or as many as you bid for. But now there are other trick taking games out there where you want to lose on purpose. What I'm mostly focused on now is Jekyll and Hyde as one of the sides. There are some times where you want to purposely lose, and it is a as a different sort of mindset. It's sort of you like you're flipping everything around and you're playing exactly opposite 
of the way that you're used to playing. I thought it was very interesting. I think you're actually underselling the genre. I think almost all trick-taking games have elements where you suddenly desperately want to lose tricks, either because you've bid nil or because you've hit your bid and you're penalizing for going over, or because you simply want someone else to take the lead and you just desperately need someone to take the lead from you by winning a trick at a given time. And shifting gears in that way, I agree with you, is one of the joys of trick-taking games. True. It's definitely... I, I meant more like a long term for the whole hand losing every sure. every trick. Yeah, whereas I know what you're saying with the one. And that's the other thing. Knowing which card to throw away as well. What I'm, what, what I'm talking about is there are some instances where you need to be left with certain cards in your hand and you desperately need to get rid of a card in order so you can do something later in that hand. I don't know how to explain it. There was just... A methodology, and so when you have an opportunity to throw a card away, it's knowing which cards to throw away. I, th- I think that's a fantastic mechanism as well. And these are a- another area where I think some of the more hobby games in this area do a good job. I'm thinking of some of the hybrids, where ostensibly it's a trick-taking game, but in point of fact, you're using that as an engine to drive something else. You already talked about Brian Boru, which is sort of an area majority slash light economic game where you're playing trick taking, but it's not really about winning tricks. Often it's about losing tricks. It's just using your cards cleverly. Juraku was a game published uh, six or seven years ago that was kind of similar. It was an area majority game that was ostensibly had a trick taking on top of it. Uh, it talked about Shamans, which is, not, again, a strange hybrid. We played Influentia last year, which... I was trying to do that at least, but I think this is actually a good illustration of what you were talking about in terms of what you like about trick-taking. Influentia, you could follow anything you wanted at any time, and sometimes I think breaking constraints could be an interesting iteration on the genre, but my particular beef with Influentia was it it felt far too loose by virtue of the fact that anyone could play anything at any given time, and so I don't think it really worked to that constraint. I have a very pointed question for you, Walker. What are your favorite what are your favorite trick taking games? Uh Jekyll and Hyde and the Crew. Mm. So no no Euchre anymore, huh? Just a, a relic of your no, past. No, I haven't play I have not played Euchre in many, many years. It's just you talk about Euchre all the time. Well, because I pl- I pl- played it so much as a child. Sure, sure. But just don't play it anymore. Because it feeds into what I said, but but throwing away cards, I didn't see that more prevalent. In the crew, like that's where I've I've noticed it more than any of the of these other trick taking games is taking the opportunity to get rid of a card so in a future hand someone can lead and or you know it's like that person needs this particular card this is my perfect opportunity to get it out of my hand. So I've already talked about the Schtick by Carl Hans Schmiel. Uh, Paula was a game by Jeffrey D. Allers that was published by Cambridge Games Factory back in the day. I actually wrote the rule book for it. And so I was I was brief, peripherally involved in this publication. Paula is really interesting because it's a game where all the cards are colors, and so you can engage in color mixing. Say, for the sake of argument, that you don't have a green card, and someone plays green, but you desperately want to win that trick. Well, you can play a blue and a yellow at the same time. It's a green card now, and you sum the values together, and there you go. You could also play in two different versions. You could... There was the bidding version, and then there was the version where you're not trying to win tricks, so... That was cool, too. I highly recommend Paula if you have a a chance to try it. It was very clever, and as somebody who never really learned the color wheel, Paula is the only reason why I understand color mixing to this day. Uh, The trick-taking game that I played the most, though, is probably my favorite Uwe Rosenberg card game, which is one of the card games he published before he became Uwe Rosenberg of Agricola and a million other worker placement games, which is Bargain Hunter. It was originally published in German as Schnappenjagd, And it's got these wonderful little anthropomorphic appliances that you're ostensibly trying to buy at a flea market. And the key conceit behind, well, there are a number of key conceits, but one of the uh, key conceits behind Bargain Hunter is any time you play offsuit, you can declare whether that offsuit is trump for that given trick. If you lead if you lead green and I can't follow green and I follow with a red, I can declare whether red is trump for that trick, which is Relevant because, in point of fact, most of the time in Bargain Hunter, you don't want to win tricks. It's very difficult to score points in Bargain Hunter. Most of the time, you're actually going to be losing uh, points. Uh, The only other thing to note about Bargain Hunter is that it led to an entire sort of shared universe of imagination for the friends that played it with me a lot. We conceived of an elaborate sitcom premise 
uh, on our playings of Bargain Hunter, which was uh, starring Woogie and uh, his uh, partner. And uh, Josephus, I think, was going to be the wacky neighbor character. We never figured out who I was going to be in the in the sitcom. We even had a theme song. Uh, there was going to be the adorable child character figure, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen of Full House with catchphrases. The only problem is the theme song, the catchphrases and the title of the show all became politically untenable in 2016 because the title of the show was going to be called I'd Trump That. And uh, the theme song was just Woogie going Trumpity Trump Trump Trumpity Trump Trump. So uh, that got ruined. That's a shame. It sounded it sounded very interesting. Oh, it was going to be terrible. <laughs> Some trick taking games I want to talk about is the Fox and the Forest games because we've talked about how long trick taking games have been on this planet, and just recently, this this genre is because it's usually always had to be played in a group of four. It's sort of how the mechanisms worked, how everything worked. But then these Fox and the Forest games came out. Not only can you now just play them with two players, but they've also figured out how to play it cooperatively. So very interesting stuff there. And also there's one called Nyet, which is also very interesting. And I played it quite a bit as well. Uh, because what you're doing is after you've looked at your initial hand, you start taking turns putting tokens on this sort of spreadsheet. And what this is going to do is going to tell you who's going to lead at the very beginning. It's going to say how many cards you're going to discard out of your hand. It's going to decide what the Trump suit's going to be, what the super Trump is going to be. There you go. You love the super Trump, don't you, Mark? Not really. And it no. also is going to tell you the value of each trick. And the interesting of that last one is that the value of each trick can go one, two, three, four, negative two. So as you're putting out the tokens and you think you're going to win all the tricks and get all these points, suddenly all of these tricks are now worth negative two points and you're in a lot of trouble. Nyet, I thought, was a fantastic game. And it's called Nyet because you can't make decisions about what's going to happen. You just rule possibilities out as they happen. And so whatever's left will actually be true. I love Nyet as well. It's in Mu and lots more. Uh, actually, one of the two modes of Paula, specifically Impressionism, is actually relatively similar to Nyet. And so I, I recommend you give that a try if you're at all curious about that. And yes, I agree with you that the opening up of the player count is another great thing that hobby trick-taking games have done. Usually it's f uh, strictly four. There are a number of hobbyist games that are either strictly three or best with three. Bargain Hunter is one of those. The Bottle Imp is another example of a hobbyist trick-taking game that's great and probably best with three. Yeah, trick-taking games tend not to be very flexible about player count. For all my complaints about the crew being incredibly brutally difficult with five players, something I think we definitively demonstrated during our charity stream, where... There may be worse hands of the crew recorded for posterity, but I certainly wouldn't know of any. But at least the crew, it's pretty flexible in terms of player count for a trick-taking game, which is not that common. Yeah, I think trick-taking games in, in, in the short time that they take, the amount of deduction and inference and communication that you get out of trick-taking games just makes them fantastic in my book. I agree. I'm always interested in trying out new ones. I'm always interested in returning back to the ones that are well-established and I know I like. And there's a lot of great communication that is hidden and embedded in those things. And that's one of the reasons why the people that I know that hate trick-taking games usually hate it because they're not really good at that kind of indirect communication. In point of fact, the the, the, the trick-taking game that I think... The, the, a game that's so close to being a trick-taking game for that reason actually is Hanabi. It's not a trick-taking game, but it feels an awful lot like a trick-taking game because it's all about this kind of implied communication. And so I really think there's a strong similarity there. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find our contact information at sowronggames.com slash contact. You can also check out all the rest of the good content on sowronggames.com. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Biggin. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. Thank you, listeners.
listeners once again for joining us for another episode of Swag Presents Masterpiece Theater in honor of His Grace, the Reverend Dr. Dr. Professor Vincent Duke of Diesel, Esquire OBE. This week we are talking about the Netflix miniseries Midnight Mass. Spoiler warning, Walker will spoil Spoil. things. Also, spoiler spoiler warning, Walker is very wrong. Spoil. So in Midnight Mass, it's a fantastic story about this uh, young man who unfortunately gets in a little bit of trouble because he's in a drunk driving accident in which he kills a young lady. And it goes through the episodes of him uh, learning to cope with uh, this awful thing that he did and uh, how he uses religion to sort of cope with that this uh, terrible thing that happened in his life and also a young lady who was in a terrible uh, position and how uh, a pregnancy sort of pushed her to uh, resolve the situation to help her escape this awful situation that she was in. All of this sounds great if it wasn't a complete lie. <laughs> you see, what actually happens in Midnight Mass is that our protagonist, our hero, decides to take this young lady out into the middle of the ocean to show her <laughs> that he's a vampire. <laughs> no, and knowing no. that, knowing, knowing, knowing that <laughs> sh- this sh- this pregnancy that practically saved her life she she didn't lose the child but it reversed she she did, wasn't pregnant anymore because the vampire blood made her unpregnant so she's going through this complete mental breakdown because of this but he feels as though this is a great time to bring her out into the middle of the ocean dump this huge story of the whole town being taken over by vampires and then spontaneously combusting (laughs) and leaving this whole situation on her shoulders. That's our hero. What a great story. (laughs) Rant done. Uh, You didn't find that scene tremendously moving? In what way? I was in tears. It It was so moving. It was it was beautiful. It was his redemption. It was his it was his only means of it. like yeah. He couldn't help her resolve the situation. He he, he think just dumping the whole thing on her is <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was the only way he could convince. Like what he was gonna have level with her. It's like we're all vampires now. There's this whole vampire problem. I'm a vampire. You should leave because I'm a vampire. Like. <laughs> He could go back and try to help her defeat the vampires. All right. Oh, God, jeez. I can't believe this. Okay, so you're quibbling about about minor... Oh, wow. <laughs> Midnight Mass was the so, best So thing. he's got a great track record. He's destroyed his parents' life. Okay, first by, of all, you know, your, notion of outlawing... heroism, your notion of heroism needs to take a backseat to storytelling, all right? Your little simplistic baby hero's journey nonsense. Go, go freaking watch your Star Wars and Marvel movies if that's all you're interested in watching, all right? <sighs> The no, show I, d- I want I want him to step up and He did. And, he did step and up. Be a person. He sacrificed himself so that she could move on. So that she could see what was going on and so that she could be convinced of the danger because there was no earthly way and they let it up very naturalistically that he could just level with her and be like, Yeah, we're all it's vampires now. He couldn't he couldn't just stick his arm out of a window and she realized that's completely unnatural. Because he knew he couldn't trust himself. He brought himself out in the middle of the of the lake because he knew that's how it had to end. Oh, gee. Okay, look. Even if, even if, even if, all right? Even if it didn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm not willing to make that concession, but even if, you get to make some things that aren't necessarily the most factually logical basis if it feeds into character development, emotional resonance, strong visuals, all three of which that scene had in spades. It and was then, utterly then, oh, I won't go beautiful. On. I was only going to say the one thing. How about his <laughs> parents? Why? Why were? Why were they the only ones that said to themselves, "Hey, we don't have to kill everybody"? Uh, no, a number of them did. A number of the congregation. Uh, well, look, it was a meditation on faith in which a number of individuals demonstrated the dangerous elements because faith, like loyalty, 
is merely a dispositional attitude. It matters what you have faith in and how you manifest it. Very much in the same way that you can be loyal to good things and you can be loyal to bad things. Some members of the congregation responded well. Some members of the congregation responded very, very poorly. Some members of the congregation were complicated individuals like the two male leads. Hamish Linklater is a brilliant actor, by the way. Fabulous, fabulous performance. He was great. So was Maddie Saracen. I don't remember his name in the show, but he will always be Matthew Saracen from Friday Night Lights for me. I normally don't like him very much as an actor. When he's not being Maddie Saracen, I thought he was pretty good. You are full of crap, and I hate you and your stupid face and your terrible opinions. <laughs> Midnight Mass was the best thing I saw last year. It was, it was, a, look, it was look, amazing. I, I, I did harp on that one spot. The, Overall, the, it was like fantastic. the greatest scene the way, of 2021. It the was way, so beautiful. The way it uh, it portrayed faith in yeah. different ways that people used faith to manipulate others and yep. or to better themselves. All of that was great. I forget what the character's name was. The woman that there was this whole uh, sort of backstory about. Oh, you, sorry, do you mean the the the, the lay? Uh, the lay practitioner of the church, or do you mean the uh, the, the the female lead who lost her pregnancy? No, the 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 priest assistant. Yeah, the, the lay practitioner, Beth. Yeah, there was, there seemed to be this whole backstory about how there was some sort of lawsuit and how she sort of helped the corporation, but they never flushed that out fully that I saw. Anyway, didn't really matter. The, the, the point was she sold out the community for the sake of the church. Or at least her perception yeah, that's what, of that's the mean, church. That's what it seemed like, but they didn't. Yeah, I guess they. I guess they hinted around it enough that they didn't really have to spell it out for you. But it just seemed as though it. It, it looked as though that it was part of the story that they were going to flush out. That they were going to explain what had happened. But anyway, long story short, I thought it was fantastic. Right down to the ending where she had like just gave up on everything. Was like yep. actually digging in the sand trying to. I I love loved all that part. One thing that I, that I think is a bit strange is that a lot of the conversation surrounding the show, and I think it's been appropriately received because a, a whole bunch of people, have, I think, have acknowledged its brilliance. Some people say that it's a, 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 it was, the story was about religion. I don't think it was. It wasn't about religion. It was about faith. Again, it was about this dispositional attitude toward, because look, I love, Religion and politics are the two things I love talking most about, right? The two things you're not supposed to talk to people about I love talking about. And I studied a bit of theology. I love talking about theology. I find it a fascinating subject. I, I've i spoken to believers. I've spoken to non-believers. I've spoken to people all kinds of different faith backgrounds about theology. Uh, this was not a show about religion. The religion didn't really matter. <laughs> like... There was no theology in the show. I mean, maybe a tiny little bit. Like, they needed the blood. They needed people to be drinking blood. Fine. That, so that part featured into it. But they didn't get into the theology of, of, of stuff like that, except for vague thematic evocations of transubstantiation. It was mostly about faith, and to, I think it was a great. The, well, there was a little bit of, pl- there was a little bit of play between Roman Catholic and Muslim faiths. There was a little bit of Sure, that. sure, but it, not, not on a, not in a theological basis. Like, there was no. No. Uh, well, I, okay, no, you're right. Sorry, there was a tiny little bit because the sheriff did, uh, in a beautiful scene, throw in Beb's face very appropriately the fact that Christ was a prophet in the in the Muslim tradition. Anyway, but you take my point. It was, it was yes, uh, and yes, it, and it was a marvelously nuanced take. I think your objections are groundless and ridiculous, and you're a bad man who should feel bad about himself. Uh, but I'm glad you agreed that it was a good show. And that, listeners was Masterpiece Theatre. Thank you very, very much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Do take care. Bye-bye.